Hi, I'm Tom Marino. At Cone Resnick, we believe that all citizens need to be informed about the issues that affect their daily lives. That's why we're proud to support the programming produced by Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by the New Jersey Education Association, Wells Fargo, Qualcare Inc., a local managed care company covering 750,000 New Jersey residents. Felician College. United Water. Making the planet sustainable is the best job on Earth. New Jersey Sharing Network. Dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation. And by Cone Resnick. Accounting, tax, and advisory. Where forward thinking creates results. Promotional support provided by NJ.com. Small news, big news, true Jersey. And by NJ Biz. All business, all New Jersey. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. It is my honor and pleasure to introduce for the first time with us uh, Michelle Larkin, Interim Vice President, Program Portfolios at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Good to have you with us. Good to be here. And let me just fully disclose that not only does the foundation underwrite our programming, but with our sister uh, partners at NJTV, you've been doing some great uh, work funding a whole series of health forums there as well. Yeah. Um, why is the foundation so committed, frankly, to supporting and underwriting discussions, conversations about the health of the people of New Jersey. Because our whole purpose is about how we together can build a culture of health in our nation. For New Jersey, that's our home state. Uh, our founder, General Johnson, was really committed to the state of New Jersey and helping it be the best it could be. That means bringing the private sector, the public sector, and community-based organizations and people together to help create the solutions that they want to implement in their communities. You know, Michelle, the, the term culture of health is used. I talked to your CEO. Mm -hmm. We had a great conversation about this a few months back. The term creating a culture of health, could you make that expression come alive for people so they say, oh, that's what you're talking about. So building a culture of health, a lot of times people think about health as whether or not I have health insurance and whether or not I can get quality health care when I need it, when I'm sick or when someone in my family is. Those are important pieces, but that's not all that goes into how healthy we are. Think about it, you know, do you have safe places that you can be physically active and that you can uh, take your kids out on a walk or play? Do you have sidewalks? That's health. Do you, that's health. Uh, how else do you exercise if you don't have a community that you can go out into because you're worried about violence or being struck down by a car mm -hmm. because you don't have sidewalks to get from your house or your apartment to uh, mm -hmm. a safe place to come together? Places where a community can come together. How do you uh, have the social supports that you need? How do you actually know that your neighbors care about you? You have to have something that you can come together around that helps our mental health. That helps our feeling like we're part of something and really helps to engage us in the civic process, which is really important to our mental and our physical health in times of distress. Before we get on the air, you also talked about job, jobs, mm -hmm. having a job. And then you talked about education and you tied that into a culture of health. Do the economic part, having a good mm -hmm. paying job. Yeah, having a good paying job makes a difference. Income is how we can afford to send our kids to good schools. Uh, it's how we have a tax base that pays for those schools. It's how we can make decisions about what doctors we're able to see if we don't have health insurance. Um, and also around education, we know that people live longer lives and make better individual decisions about their health, the more education that they have. So all of these things are tied together. It really is a holistic uh, bringing together of all the things that go into whether or not we're healthy and whether or not our communities are healthy. Part of that is bringing businesses in. You know, as a state, we have, you know, a fairly decent unemployment rate. Um, we can do better about bringing in businesses and creating policies that help businesses have an advantage and want to come here and want to stay here. Part of that is making sure that our population is well educated. Part of that is also making sure that they are healthy employees. Because they're, if they're healthy, if their kids are healthy, they're going to be more focused on the job, be more productive, and the health care costs for businesses are going to be lower. So all of those things come together. That's the so-called holistic approach? 
child care? Yeah, I mean, I think it's the I think it's thinking about all of the things that go into our health and really shifting our mindset from the repair side. Mm. If we're sick, we have care when we need it, which is incredibly important. But also focusing on the front end of how do we make sure that people are as healthy and as re resilient as they can be, and that we're preventing illness, and that we're having not only um, physical health and mental well-being, but that we also have communities that are healthy in terms of their economic vibrancy, that they have safe places for people to live and to be physically active. The other thing the uh, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation is very actively engaged in is these county health rankings. Mm -hmm. These are health rankings around the relative health of the people in the, the 21 counties of New Jersey? Yeah. So the county health rankings, we've been doing it for six years with our partners at University of Wisconsin. We rank every county, nearly every county, within the 50 states. Uh, we don't compare states to states, but in New Jersey, we're able to compare Burlington County, where I live, to How Mercer Essex County, County where I live? to Essex County, where you live. You're sort of uh, in the lower middle. Believe me, I um, know. <laughs> I've, saw, I've seen the right. So you know, what, does that, what does that tell me? So I look at it and I say, hey, our county's not doing as well as it should be doing, and I turn around and I say, oh, I should, we should get the government officials to fix that. That's not the response you're no. looking for. It's not, um, because that doesn't solve everything. Um, you know, government has a role to play, uh, but so does the private industry. So do uh, moms and dads in the parent-teacher association. So do educators, because it's about your community, right? How, what do they do? So they can actually, county health rankings will tell you all of the different things that we've been talking about, education, unemployment, children, the percentage of children living in poverty. We have large numbers of kids living in poverty in the state, and we know that that sets them up as, uh, that the odds are against them from the beginning, that they're already at a disadvantage for doing well in school, for making good choices as they get older in life. And so what the county health rankings do is you can look at Essex, you can compare it to Hunterdon, you can compare it to Cumberland, and it allows you to see where you're doing well and where you could do better. So for example, as a mom uh, in my Burlington County, I took a look at our rankings, and you can bet that I uh, had a conversation with the president of our Parent Teacher Association to say, why don't we have uh, sidewalks and crosswalks and stoplights so that my child can walk safely to school? It's a way for her to get physical activity it's also a way for her to be out in fresh air, and it's a way for her to come together with other parents and other kids you did so that she has a sense of community. Yeah, we're not there yet in our town, but, but we're... But you're starting to push it. Mm -hmm. But we're so, starting so, to have that conversation. Sorry for interrupting, Michelle. Part of the goal is to get citizens to be more actively engaged in the health, improving the health of their own communities. Right. Right, it is. Uh, and the county health rankings, not only, uh, so the website is countyhealthrankings.org. So you can see the scorecard there, but more importantly, I think, is you have the rankings part, but you also have a roadmaps to health section on that. So you can go in and say, I'm a business leader. What can I do as a business leader to actually help my community move forward? What can I do as a parent uh, in the Parent Teacher Association? What can I do as an educator? And they have resources and action steps that you can take to help stimulate. Is it a exhaustive list? No, but it gives but people, it makes Steve, to your point, those little concrete steps that you can take that add up to bigger change. Is that, by the way, in terms of websites, is is it linked back to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation website? There is a link on there. You can get to it from our website, and you can also get to it, us from the University of Wisconsin website, but the website itself is countyhealthrankings.org, and it also has all of the roadmaps piece there. You're hopeful we're going to make some progress? I am, in part because what we did uh, this past year is as a foundation, which, you know, we're committed to our home state, we actually funded a coach to work with people, communities that are interested on the county health rankings and what can we do as a community to dig into the data, to add to the data, but more importantly, how do we have that conversation where we're bringing all kinds of people in and it's not just government or it's not just the public health department or the hospitals, mm. but how do we bring An all the people coach. in our community, 
a coach. Yeah, who's available to the state. Uh, you can get to it. There's a get help button on the County Health Rankings website. You can click on it and they'll be there. And um, part of that is being led by a program that we've invested in here in the state for a long time, New Jersey Health Initiatives, led by Bob Atkins. It's great and, stuff. Yeah, it's great. It's an incredible program and they're about helping the state be as healthy as it can be. Well, we are proud in public broadcasting to be partners with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And we're so grateful for having you guys. You do a great job. Well, thank you. On behalf of our partners at NJTV as well. Thanks, Michelle Larkin, who is the interim vice president, program portfolios at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Stay right there. Oh. Uh, we'll be right back right after this, talking health. Good stuff. Thanks. To see more Caucus New Jersey with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are pleased to be joined by Mark Motone, the 2015 New Jersey Teacher of the Year, uh, Pre-K special education teacher at Wallace Elementary School. How you doing? Good. We're about to see a video from the classroom close-up series done by our partners at the New Jersey Education Association. I met you in Atlantic City. Yes. The NJA convention, right? That was That's great. That's right. It was awesome. It was great. I had a great time. Um, real quick, before we see this video, how great is it being teacher of the year? It's awesome. You, you know, you're able to visit schools, educators. You get to see what's going on in uh, different communities. Uh, Something that you're not going to get being in the classroom, you know, all the time, you know. So uh, it's been really great connecting educators with educators throughout the state, even across state lines. So um, you're an ambassador for educators. I just made that up. It, it sounds <laughs> true. good, but uh, it is true. You ready to see this video? Let's do it. Let's do it. I know you've seen it, I've seen it, but more importantly, you need to see it. This classroom close up, seeing the teacher of the year. It's great stuff. Check it out. Thursday, high five. Awesome job. All right. Who wants Since 1995, to Mark Matone, a pre K special education teacher, has devoted much of his time to doing what is best for his students. Selected as the 2014 2015 New Jersey State Teacher of the Year, Mark's dedication and passion is not only felt by his colleagues, but also by his students. What letter makes it sound? Jeff. Oh, you're so smart. Autism, I find, is a very complicated disability. It's complicated because every child I've ever worked with um, have always needs something individualized. No, it's not a cookie cutter approach in how we teach it. And not just in the classroom, but even the needs inside a home environment are so different. It's, a, it's really a clean slate, and you need to really build a foundation for that child so that that child can learn. Ava was diagnosed as being on the autism spectrum when she was two and a half. We did uh, six months of early intervention, and then she was transitioned into the ABA program, which Mark runs. So I was always uh, comfortable with her being in special ed. I mean, obviously, it's everyone's dream for their child to be mainstreamed, and uh, I feel, you know, under Mark's direction, she has been able to reach her potential. He's, he's given us hope and help when we felt hopeless and helpless. I made a lot of dreams come true. When you're a teacher, I think you bring some of that parenting in the classroom. I think there's more of an understanding, but there's also that understanding of what goes on in your child's education as well. My son was about two years old. We knew he was having um, speech delays. We had him evaluated for speech, and we found out he had a nine-month delay. And the uh, next day, he ended up uh, going into uh, seizures right at dinner. He's on medication now. Um, he's in a preschool uh, classroom. He receives speech. So, you know, I just want to make sure in the end that he's happy. That's it. It's like, and he literally doesn't come in my class. Took him from there. And where, where do you want to put him? You just want to swing him? My goal for each child is that they are able to learn to their maximum potential. Because even at the preschool, you're building that foundation. If I've set low expectations for them, then everybody's going to set low expectations for them. Don't ignore them just because, well, they have a disability. They don't know how to say hi. We'll teach it to them. It doesn't make a difference because they deserve that.
I don't like to use the word success. I like to use that we're on the right path. Stop that monkey ride right at it. <laughs> Did you like that song? Yeah. yeah. How personal is all this for you? Very. It's very personal. I think um, when we talk about what we go into our careers for, in education, we talk about passion. We talk about the love of learning. Um, there is something else that you just can't describe. And it's, it's getting children to learn when people thought it was either impossible or um, they've tried so many other interventions or settings or uh, programs, and now their child's able to learn. I, so it's, it's very personal. I, I put every ounce of what I could into my students um, because I think any, any student uh, deserves that kind of attention. How often I think about the concept of empathy. Do you try to imagine what it might be like for these children and their parents? You know, I don't walk in their parents' footsteps, but they've invited me into their homes. And I've been on the phone with them midnight. I've Skyped during, could be questions or meltdowns or sleeping disturbances that they need help with. Um, I will never walk in their footsteps. The closest I have was with my son, but they, their life is very difficult. Why? Um, Describe what they're facing. They're facing challenges that, you know, especially in the preschool level, when you have a parent coming into preschool, um, they don't know what's going on with their child. Their child may have just been diagnosed or not even have a diagnosis. They may just have characteristics of, but not diagnosed yet. And it's very scary for them. And you as an educator has to, you have to be very sensitive to their needs. You have to walk them through every step. And it's more than just teach, teaching their kids. It's about really um, getting to know them and understanding their parents' needs as well as their child's needs. And how can they best feel um, that they can help their child? I've been in many, many um, homes where the parents just don't feel they can give enough to their child. And they don't have anybody to turn to. I mean, we know it's a fact, resources for children with autism or special needs is very expensive. Um, and if I can give them the expertise that I have, um, then I'm going to do that. And if they need other resources, I'm going to hook them up with that. That's, it's, it, sometimes you have to break down that red tape for a child because in the end, that's who suffers. How are you able to do all that and still do for your own family? There's a balance. Um, there, there's a balance. It's a hard balance. Um, do you ever get so consumed by your own students that it's hard to keep the balance? Um, no. No, um, there, there are times that, um, you know, usually I put everything away until maybe my kids go to bed. And then I'll get on the email at eight o'clock. If I have to talk to a parent, um, if I have a meeting after school, you know, I get out at three o'clock. So it's that extension of outside your time. It's not just a job for me. So someone says your job end at, ends at three, you say? No, it doesn't. When does it end? It ends when I stop receiving emails and phone calls from parents. But it's not going to end that way. My parents know, and that's something you put down, that there are a lot of needs. And sometimes I may be the only resource. But they know and they respect you know, um, my family. You know, they're not going to you know, impose on that. But I think it's how I can help that is by helping them after school or before school and bring them in for training and go home mm -hmm. to train them they're not going to need me as much anymore. They're going to take the lead. And finally, the greatest reward you get out of your work is? Watching a child learn. It's a moment that you can, I'm going to tell you, you cannot describe it. It's, it's a skill that you've been working on for months and months, and it's that moment it just clicks. And then they're able to demonstrate it at home. And it may be so small to us as educators, because yeah. we look at the bigger picture, but for those parents and for that child, that was that stepping stone that's going to take them further than we ever knew. It's no secret why uh, Mark Morton is the 2014-15 New Jersey Teacher of the Year. 
Thank you very much. You honor us by your presence and more importantly, by the work you do every day. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be right back right after this. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. To see more Caucus New Jersey with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are pleased to be joined by Dr. Justin Sambol, who is Medical Staff President and Chief of Cardiothoracic Surgery, University Hospital. He also has another title. He's Senior Associate Dean of Clinical Affairs, Rutgers, New Jersey Medical School. How are you doing? Good. Explain the two connections, University Hospital and Rutgers. So uh, as most people, I think, know, uh, about two years ago, UMDNJ, uh, which had a couple medical schools and owned University Hospital, uh, became Rutgers University. However, University Hospital spun off to become a separate state-owned entity. So everything's under the Rutgers umbrella to one extent? So the medical staff, by and large, are faculty uh, of Rutgers University, but University Hospital is a separate entity, yeah. separate from Rutgers. And, and University Hospital still does extraordinary work in a lot of areas. Trauma, big area? A lot of trauma surgery, We're very well known for that. A number of other things, neurosurgery, head and neck surgery, uh, cardiology, heart failure. I'm a cardiac surgeon, so yeah. do good work there too. So, so connect it for us, uh, doctor. When you have a hospital that's so involved in so many important clinical areas, but then you've got this medical education piece, tie the two together. Paint that picture for those of us who don't have the medical background and help us understand why that's so important and ultimately, frankly, what it means to the rest of us. So the mission of New Jersey Medical School and University Hospital really is to educate doctors of tomorrow, the future doctors, residents. I was a medical student there. I did my training there. And many of us are there to pass on the things that we've learned and the things that we do to the junior doctors and people who are learning. OK, but the fact that university is there does it create opportunities for students in the medical school that otherwise wouldn't be because you're so tied to university hospitals so they see things, they experience things, they learn things that otherwise would not happen in another medical school? Sure, I think... For example, the, lay that out for us. Yeah, I think the, the types of patients that we take care of, the acuity, the severity of the disease that we take care of, uh, the mission to care for the people of Newark and Essex County really provides for a tremendous opportunity for the students of New Jersey Medical School. Go back and make the connection with Rutgers. What does Rutgers offer you? So, you know, I think now that we're part of Rutgers University, it provides a, a very large state university with a tremendous amount of resources that I think for the students gives a tremendous amount of opportunity that will help uh, just bring in resources to, to the, the medical school. And Big Ten sports, of course. Yeah, Big Ten sports. Oh, why, why do you have to get that in there? <laughs> that matters, doesn't it? Uh, you know, look, I think it's important. Uh, I think it's important for the state. I think it's great for the school. And uh, I think it's a big attraction. I was talking to a colleague in the healthcare field who was out at Stanford University yesterday uh, and talking to me about the research going on out there. And she said to me, it is extraordinary what's going on here and the impact it's having in the research community and the medical community. And I thought to myself, is that possible one day that what you're talking about could be, I mean, could we compete? Could Absolutely. We? I Describe think, it. I think uh, you know, New Jersey Medical School, Robert Wood Johnson Medical School already have very robust research programs that were going on before. Now you combine that with all the things that have been happening at Rutgers. And uh, I think you really can, potentially, we could really build a tremendous university that will be great for the state of New Jersey. What's it going to take? You know, it takes resources. It, take, it takes infrastructure. Uh, it takes uh, a willingness and a, a drive to do On it. And I think the, well, 
I think on the part of the state, on the part of uh, the people in New Jersey, and I think on the part of the leadership of Rutgers. And I think the leadership of Rutgers really is dedicated to that goal. When you say the people of New Jersey, what can we do? Well, I, I think uh, support the school and uh, support its mission and understand that the finances are important and uh, it's something that... It's not just going to happen on its own. It's not going to happen. It definitely requires the state and financial support. I'm curious about this. I asked uh, some of your colleagues this question. I want to ask you as well. When did you know that medicine would be your professional life? So it was something I really decided early on. Um, I always visioned myself as a doctor, and I think that... How far back? As far as I could remember, that's really? what I wanted Seriously? to do. Really? Seriously. My father owned a construction company, but all I could think about was becoming a doctor. Because? It just the science. I love the science, helping people. It really combined all the things that I thought were really important to me. And all the challenges that you've had to face, and the changes in the healthcare industry, and the regulations, and everything else, and you say... Still love it, would do it again. I think, uh, you know, I grew up in this time with change, and we've been able to adapt to it. And uh, I think, you know, medicine, there are definitely pitfalls and struggles, but I think it's a great profession. Dr. Sample, I appreciate it, and we are glad you made that decision. Keep it up, You're making a difference every day. Thank you very much. Thanks, Steve. Appreciate it. The preceding program has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence, and 13 for WNET, NJTV, and WHYY. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by the New Jersey Education Association, Wells Fargo, Qualcare Inc., Felician College, United Water, New Jersey Sharing Network, and by Cone Resnick. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Caucus New Jersey has been produced in partnership with TriStar Studios.